Good morning and good afternoon, everyone joining us today. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So hello, my name is Ava Askari. I'm the senior program manager for our health vertical here in Silicon Valley. Um, I oversee and run the plug and play health accelerator program here. Um, I'm very excited for this event today. It's co-hosted by one of our wonderful portfolio companies, Health Gorilla. Um, so in this webinar, we're going to be learning a little bit more about how digital health innovators are using Health Gorilla's APIs to power data access for healthcare providers across the country. So before we get started, I wanted to quickly go over the agenda and some housekeeping items before turning it over to the Health Gorilla team. Um, so to kick us off, we're going to hear a short introduction from Ali Zaman um, from the Health Gorilla team. Then we'll kick off um, our panelists. Um, so each of the panelists in the panel discussion later on will be giving a brief overview of their company. So we'll learn a little bit more about what they do and how they're using Health Gorilla's APIs. And then we'll go into the, dis the discussion where everyone in the audience will actually have a chance to submit questions. So queue up your questions um, and we'll do a live Q&A after the, dis the discussion. So going over to the housekeeping. So a few things, there should be a Q&A button um, on the bottom of your screen. So feel free at any point during um, this event today to submit your questions and we'll try to get to all the questions in the Q&A at the end of the session. Um, if you have any general questions or comments about the event, feel free to use the chat feature um, and please remain muted unless you're presenting. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ali to give us an introduction to Health Gorilla. So Ali, take it away. Great. Uh, thanks, Ava. Um, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining this event. My name is Ali Zaman. I am the Vice President of Marketing at Health Gorilla. And uh, we're really excited to hold this webinar uh, for a couple reasons. Um, since the start of the pandemic, the demand for interoperability has accelerated. Um, and our team at Health Gorilla has seen a lot of interest from digital health developers um, who are really looking for two things. Um, first, it's figuring out efficient ways to access clinical data for their applications. And second, it's thinking through creative and unique ways to apply that data so they can better support um, their end users with better functionality or better insights. And so our goal for this event is to foster a dialogue among some of the leading players in digital health who have already invested in interoperability, um, have been through the implementation journey, um, and have made it an important part of their product strategy. And so we'd ultimately like to teach others in the community about what kinds of use cases are actually being deployed um, to healthcare providers, and ultimately um, share the impact it's having in today's environment. So I'd like to introduce the moderator for this event, uh, Jitin Asnani. Um, Jitin is one of the leading experts on health information exchange, having spent time at ONC, Athena Health, and the Commonwealth Health Alliance, uh, where he built one of the largest data sharing networks in the country. And so really thrilled to have him leading the discussion. Um, I'll hand it over to you, Jitin. Perfect. Thanks, Yuli. Thank you, Yuli. Um, I'm really, I'm really, really uh, pleased and honored to be able to have an opportunity here to uh, moderate this panel. Uh, I, the th you know, what I'd, I'd like to kind of start off with before I introduce our first uh, of our three uh, panelists today is going to share a quick perspective. You know, so again, I'm, I'm head of partnerships at Patient Ping, um, helping to uh, enable Patient Ping to build out uh, an ecosystem of partners who either contribute to or leverage our real-time notifications platform to enable care collaboration. I've spent the last 10 years driving interoperability across the public and private sectors, starting first with the, Depart the Federal Department of Health and Human Services through their ONC department, and uh, again, Athena Health and Commonwealth Health Alliance. And you know, one of the things I'd like to point out before, as we get into these panel uh, presentations is when interoperability um, started becoming a thing, uh, more than 10 years ago, around 10 years ago, really it, with the advent of meaningful use started becoming a, uh, a, an inevitability for the industry. The notion was much like the, 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 HT, the, the predecessors to HTML and the, those technologies that made the internet, 
um, it was about opening up data silos. It was about opening up those repositories of data that enabled you access as a user of those same repositories in order to be able to more effectively utilize them and utilize data from multiple repositories. Just as we saw in the days of the early internet, really the pre-internet, the real power became not just from opening up those same data repositories in today's world, the EHRs, but the fact that you could actually then build products and services that brought a whole new kind of dimension to sort of innovation that you could layer on top. And, and, and the set of that, those sets of products and services that actually allowed you to do a lot more than simply be able to read out of a, you know, a data repository. Um, we've seen EHRs themselves certainly embrace this, but this beautiful emerging ecosystem of digital health companies who are in a similar position as those early internet uh, um, uh, utilizers in terms of creating those products and services. So today, you know, what I've asked of the audience is, uh, as our panelists speak about what it is they're doing, think a little bit about both the innovation that they're enabling, how they've kind of conceived of this notion that their product or service can make healthcare, can help transform healthcare and bring us to a place that we couldn't have conceived of uh, even a few short years ago. And then also how they're utilizing interoperability intelligently to make those products and services a reality. So that's my challenge to the audience. Think about that, listen out for it. Uh, my challenge to, this, to the panelists to, to articulate uh, what it is their products and services do and how they utilize interoperability to do things which, again, are, are above and beyond what could have been conceived of until that point where we started looking at the world, not just as a set of data silos, but as um, a more of a place where the data is much more fluid and utilizable. With that in mind, I'm going to introduce our first panelist. I'd like to introduce Sam Ryder, um, who leads the engineering team at Verda. Verda is uh, Verda's diabetics platform, diabetes platform, uh, has been utilized to reverse type two diabetes. Uh, there's a great story here that you heard from hear from Sam in terms of both their product as well as how is it using lab information exchange. Um, to, to enable the, their core value proposition. Uh, Verda is one of the early adopters of Health Gorilla in this case. So um, I think you're gonna learn a little bit about how they thought about their problem and, and solve through it. Sam has a distinguished history having previously worked at um, EHR, um, uh, at one of the bleeding, bleeding edge EHR companies, uh, Practice Fusion, as well as with Health Fidelity. And uh, like me is an alma mater of the federal government having worked at ONC um, uh, back in 2012. So with that, Sam, can I pass it over to you to get us started? Yes, thank you for the introduction, Jen. Let me share my screen here. All right, can everyone see my screen? Are we good? I'll take that as a yes. Um, all right, so hi, I, I'm Sam Ryder. I'm an engineering manager at Verta Health. Today, I'm going to briefly share how we're leveraging interoperability and health Gorilla's platform to reverse diabetes during the COVID-19 pandemic. To start off, let me introduce Verta. So as Jit mentioned, um, we reverse type two diabetes. Verta is the first and only medical treatment clinically proven to reverse type two diabetes. Our treatment helps patients control their blood sugar without surgery or the use of diabetes-specific medications. Our fully virtual provider-led medical group delivers care through our internally developed continuous remote care platform. We use lab results, specifically hemoglobin A1C observations, to measure patient success. As a fully remote clinic, we rely on patient service centers to process our orders and administer tests. Lab results are also used by Verta providers to monitor patient health. This is a screen from the app our care teams use. Providers are alerted when new lab results are available and can see results over time. HealthGorilla's Fire APIs make supporting these features actually pretty easy. Before partnering with HealthGorilla, our team manually placed orders and transcribed results. As our clinic scaled, those manual processes started to break down. So in January 2019, we started placing lab orders for our patients and acquiring results for those orders through HealthGorilla's platform. HealthGorilla's modern standards-based APIs empowered us to implement electronic ordering and result acquisition with a national network of labs in weeks. Without HealthGorilla's platform, we probably still 
either be relying on manual processes or implementing legacy standards like HL7 v2. For some context, a integration with LabCorp, like point-to-point -point HL7 version 2 integration, takes about six months. Um, I know because I worked on it at Practice Fusion. Um, so this slide shows a high level view of our system. Our lab service, the big blue box in the middle there, uses HealthRail APIs to submit orders and read new results from HealthRail. When those results are available, we write them to our internal fire server, which is in Google's Cloud Healthcare API. Cloud Healthcare API then publishes a message and a subscriber creates an alert for our provider team in the internal app that you saw on the previous slide. Spark then uses the lab service to read the results that are stored in our internal fire server. COVID-19 has significantly disrupted this approach to lab result acquisition. Patients need to avoid in-person care whenever possible, including the patient service centers that we relied on to process our lab orders. This change has highlighted the cost of repeat tests and the need for a clinic to interoperate with other care providers. If a Verta patient gets a lab test from their primary care physician, we must acquire those results and keep patients at home given the risks of in-person care. To do just that, we're leveraging HealthGrow's Patient360 API to acquire results for lab tests that our patients have already had. As folks enroll in the Verta treatment, we're able to query Patient360 to acquire any data on our patients that's available in Commonwealth or Care Quality, the two largest health information exchange networks in the United States. At the beginning of treatment, we're specifically interested in acquiring baseline lab results necessary for us to measure success. Um, before patient 360, we would send pretty much every patient to a patient service center to acquire those results. This slide summarizes how we're updating our system um, to support result acquisition through patient 360. Our patients consent to patient 360 enrollment in our app. We store a record of that consent in our internal fire store. Again, Healthcare API publishes a message and a subscriber this time, a subscriber um, queries patient 360 for available records. Results of that query, the query to patient 360, are in the form of continuity of care documents. Those documents we then post back to HealthGorilla -Oh through the document reference fire API. Um, and HealthGorilla -Oh system processes those documents and they're available uh, as kind of structured lab results or diagnostic report fire resources that then flow through the system we saw, um, our existing lab result system. With Patient 360's automatic update feature, new results uh, automatically flow through this diagnostic report API or flow to the diagnostic report API and are available to our system through our existing like kind of processing mechanism. Altogether, Patient 360 helps us get back to patient monitoring and measuring success with a whole lot less in-person care. In the next few months, we plan on expanding our use of Patient360 and encouraging external members of our patient's care teams to pull data we are sharing from these health information exchanges in order to stay on top of patient progress. Just like we are pulling lab results uh, for care that patients receive, receive outside of the Verda clinic, other providers can pull the uh, data summarizing the care that we provide for to patients from these same health information exchanges. Um, so to learn more about Verta and the work we're doing, check us out at vertahealth.com. Thanks. Terrific, thank you, Sam. Um, before, before I go ahead and introduce our next speaker, just a reminder for the audience that if you have uh, any questions you'd like to ask, feel free to press the, the Q&A button, post those questions, we'll keep a running tab. Uh, we'll try to answer uh, all the questions uh, that we can as we get to the end of the, the panel presentations. And, um, uh, and we'll probably pose a few ourselves as, as, the question, as, the, uh, as our panelists present. So please feel free to, to share uh, your questions beforehand so we can look through them. Now let's, uh, let me introduce you uh, to our next speaker. Uh, it's Dr. Justin Zaghi. Um, who is leading the clinical team at HEAL, who is and he's responsible there for the clinical performance and strategy. Uh, the company HEAL, for those of you who don't know, uh, enables house calls and they've shifted to a telemedical, uh, telemedicine type of approach during this period of COVID. 
Um, Dr. Zaghi there has built Heal's HIE strategy uh, focused on getting, datas, getting data to providers uh, for the clinical context uh, of, of the care. Now, before I pass it on to Dr. Zaghi, one thing I'd like to point out is that he has an ex exceedingly uh, distinctive background. Um, he has an MD from Harvard Medical School, was actually named into Boston Magazine's Top Future Doctors back in 2009. Um, he and I share an alma mater. He's an MBA from Harvard Business School, where he achieves several uh, notable distinctive uh, distinctions. Uh, he has an undergrad from UCLA, where he co-founded and led the health systems and management pathway. And that's just the set of accolades that I actually remember. So I will pass it now to, uh, to Dr. Zaghi. I'll uh, give him an opportunity to add any more that he wanted to call out that I missed. And uh, please tell us about uh, what yourself and what HEAL are um, uh, doing in the enablement of uh, better care. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. Very excited to be part of this group. Um, as mentioned, I'm the Senior Medical Director at HEAL. Um, and I'm gonna share some slides with you about you know, what exactly it is uh, that we do. Uh, but essentially our premise is that primary care belongs at home. And this is especially relevant during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, people are concerned about going into the doctor's office. And in many cases, rightfully so, there may be other people who are sick around them. Um, but more important than, than, than that and the convenience, um, you know, providing care at home actually improves outcomes. Um, and we've demonstrated this through, you know, reduced costs, uh, through improved clinical outcomes. And, you know, we've, we've uh, very intently leveraged Health Gorilla to improve our outcomes as well. So a little bit more about our model. Um, you know, we've been around for five years and the core of our model initially has been house calls. And we view house calls as the foundation of our care. So, um, you know, if you ever receive a house call from, from a heel doctor, you know, we're, we accept most insurances. We're located in California, in Washington, New York, New Jersey, um, and soon some other states as well. But the, the first house call is quite a magical experience because the doctor comes to your home, they can see your home, they can meet your loved ones, they can see your pets, and they can really do a thorough comprehensive assessment. They can look at your medications and do a comprehensive medication reconciliation. Um, you know, I've had patients where they've been falling and you can tell that there's rugs or a lot of clutter that's contributing to that. And we essentially deliver all of the care at home. Part of our, our model is also the second pillar, which is remote monitoring. So essentially we provide the patient with a device. It's about the size of a deck of cards and um, it couples to a Bluetooth enabled device it may be a glucometer, a blood pressure cuff, a scale or a pulse oximeter. And we use this data that the patient provides to provide real-time care to the patient. So we track the patient's blood pressures over time. We make interventions. If their blood sugars are high, we make interventions. And this, um, this has actually been, been shown to improve outcomes. We have some clinical data. And then finally is telemedicine. This has really been accelerated uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so, you know, we have a really, I would call it best in class telemedicine offering where patients can access us from their phone, from an internet browser and really get extraordinary care. Um, and core to, to all of our, our platforms is really having connected health data. And this is something that I've been ex ex exceptionally passionate about and something that Health Gorilla has been quite helpful for. Um, you know, here, this is actually what, what, what it looks like in our EMR. It's quite simple. You press a button, like a health gorilla button, you tap another button, and then it starts searching for clinical records. And, you know, just to bring this to life, you know, in terms of how we use this, um, you know, we use this anytime we want to get more information about a patient. Um, oftentimes, this is more helpful in older patients, in sicker patients, and also for new patients. So especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, it's quite helpful to literally just push those buttons and you can access all of their data. They may have received care from other hospitals, other health systems. And, you know, similar to, to what we were hearing from the Verta team, you know, we've noticed that we've been able to reduce waste by accessing prior health data. So like a real live patient example to share about this. So I, I saw a patient in, a, in a February who literally just um, I, you know, called for a house call. I had no idea what the reason was. And she's an 80 year old female. Um, she just came back from the hospital and had sustained terrible burns on both of her arms. 
and you know unfortunately was living by herself and actually a little bit confused herself she couldn't tell me her full medical history she couldn't tell me exactly what happened in the hospital and you know having come to the patient's home a brand new patient i literally had almost no information and so what did i do i went on health gorilla and i found all of the patient's health records i found her discharge summary I found all of her labs, her vaccine records, her medication history, and was able to, to provide her with, with what I think was really world-class care that was um, informed by, by all of the data that we could potentially have for this patient. Um, and that patient ended up doing quite well. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for, for Health Girl in that case. And we've used this system in, in many other cases as well. Um, so, you know, this, this, this page kind of brings together some of the the, the benefits of using a health inform information exchange. You know, I alluded to the optimized outcomes. So getting hospital records, prior data. So, you know, oftentimes patients may not know, have they had their pneumonia vaccine? Have they had their shingles vaccine? Um, and if I'm able to access the data at the point of care, I can actually see and, and therefore provide the most appropriate care. And so that helps us actually in a, uh, quality perspective as well. So, you know, as a, um, as, as a, as a health physician organization, we are reporting our outcomes to various insurance companies and we can close these care gaps and show them that the mammogram is done, the A1C is collected, uh, colon cancer screening has been done. Um, and we can do that in part by accessing the data through Health Gorilla. Um, the other way in which this is extremely helpful is in, you know, reducing waste. There's a couple ways in which this reduces waste. So, so I would estimate that maybe 70% of the time there is good data in Health Gorilla and 30% of the time, you know, the, the system, you know, the prior physician that they were seeing doesn't upload data, which is, which is just the, the, the reality of today. But previously, anytime I wanted to access data for the patient, I'd have to fill out um, like a, a HIPAA release form, have the patient sign the form, fax it, you know, 90% of the time when you fax that HIPAA release form, the other physician's office never ends up sending the data back. So you got to call them, hassle them, call them, call them, right? And so as a result, we've seen a 70% reduction in the need for these release forms. That saved our clinical team quite some time in that they don't have to go chasing these, these forms. And also, you know, as, as the Verda team alluded to, we've seen reductions in the need to repeat labs and repeat imaging because we have that and see that they may have done that at other points of care. And in addition, you know, a lot of our visits, we're, we're a very rapidly growing startup. Um, you know, we're, we're adding new markets, probably like three markets every year at least. And as a result, many of our patients are brand new and being able to have some data about the patients before we even see them can be quite helpful because that really improves our efficiency and makes it a more seamless uh, patient experience as well. So um, that's, that's a bit of an overview and happy to hand it back to you guys. Terrific, thank you, Dr. Zaghi. And, and just so all, uh, everybody is aware, I, I will ask all our panelists to sh share uh, their info that they can share over here uh, for their company and uh, their sales um, at the end of the presentation so that uh, if you wanna reach out to any of our panelists, you'll, you'll have that opportunity to do so. Uh, let's let's go ahead to um, our third panelist. Uh, last but not least, in fact, it gives me a great amount of pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Alan's son. Uh, Alan, uh, Alan and I actually have been friends for the last 20 years. In fact, we just realized today that we've known each other 20 years. So happy anniversary, Alan. Uh, great, been, been a great 20 years uh, and uh, hopefully, hopefully many more to come. One thing I, uh, what, you know, before I pass it over to Alan, just as a, to, by way of introduction, Alan today leads the product management function at Pixio. Um, he has spent over the last 15 years um, delivering a variety of health products across the healthcare continuum, across the, uh, the healthcare ecosystem. Previously, he has worked with SIAPS, with Lyra, and with Hippocrates, delivering you know, across the gamut of precision medicine and behavioral health and um, you know, physician reference material. So a, a wide variety of experiences there in digital health. Uh, and I'm sure has kind of come across the question of the role interoperability plays again and again. Today, I'm excited to hear Alan as he speaks about Apixio and the work that Apixio does 
um, in utilizing interoperability to enable uh, better uh, sort of value-based care and the and, um, and, and the, uh, the participation of the payer in the healthcare system. Alan, I'll pass it on to you. Great, thank you, Jitin, for the introduction, and thanks for including me in this conversation. Um, as you're hearing from other panelists, although we have a long ways to go, interoperability is advancing and creating a lot of value within uh, healthcare. And we're seeing this in real time as companies are responding to the COVID-19 pandemic and the effects of it. Um, I'll walk through a use case that's similar to what uh, Dr. Zaghi just uh, talked about, but from a different perspective, the perspective of how health plans are enabling some of this information for use uh, at the point of care for providers. But first, I will uh, talk a little bit about um, Apixio and what we do, and I'll share my screen so you can follow along. There we go. All right. So uh, Apixio, it's a Bay Area healthcare analytics company. Uh, we started about 10 years ago, and our initial focus was on interoperability as an HIE, thus the origin of our name, um, creative maybe. Uh, but we've since uh, focused on uh, leveraging AI to derive insights from clinical documents in support of value-based care programs. And what I mean by that is as health plans and risk-bearing providers transition to value-based care, uh, they have to evolve uh, how they're using data to support kind of new reporting, measurement, and documentation requirements for reimbursement as well as their risk-stratified care programs. You know, for example, uh, for risk, uh, the focus is on uh, conditions, uh, member diagnoses, ICD-10 codes, to determine what the reimbursement amounts are. Um, so the sicker the member population, uh, the higher the reimbursement uh, uh, payments. Similar for quality, they're looking at the services provided, uh, CPT HICPICS uh, as an example, uh, to determine that the members who should be receiving care are getting care. Um, it's a measurement program with incentives attached to it um, for, for health plans. And then their care programs being able to ensure that they're uh, using the member risk to uh, determine and align what the need is for the appropriate levels of care. All of these require um, data and the better and more complete the data is, the easier it is to manage those programs. Uh, but we know that the clinical data systems and data entry habits just aren't optimized to create that kind of quality data. Um, instead, much of the data that would benefit these programs are either incomplete, inaccurate, or oftentimes captured in unstructured data, which is really difficult to aggregate. So we focused our business on finding insights uh, within unstructured data to create a more complete and accurate profile for a patient to support these value-based care programs. And we've done this by investing in a platform uh, that will aggregate data from various sources um, including from payers, oftentimes we receive scanned clinical documents as PDFs uh, that we'll need you know, OCR and, and pull in. And then we use that data and run our machine learning and AI to identify those insights. And then we leverage those insights for a variety of the solutions that we offer. And today I'll talk about one of those called uh, Perspective Insights. And this simply put is an API. Um, it can deliver a set of existing and predicted patient conditions to an EHR or whatever the workflow tool is that a clinician is using. And the intent here is simply to remind a provider which of the patient's chronic conditions have yet to be addressed uh, in a given year um, and make sure that those conditions are effectively managed and those condition codes are accurately captured uh, for use for measurement and reporting purposes. Uh, with COVID, we've uncovered another need for this information similar to what uh, Justin described. And this is around uh, the drive for virtual care. Um, so one of the government programs uh, that we support is Medicare Advantage. Uh, the members of Medicare Advantage are seniors, often with underlying conditions, those who are at risk um, for complications of COVID-19 and thus most encouraged to shelter in place. Um, however, their uh, conditions still require care. They need access to primary care services. Um, and they and their providers are turning to virtual care at unprecedented rates. Um, this is new territory for most of these patients, also new territory for most of their providers, and it comes with inherent challenges. 
Uh, there's a technology and usability challenge. Um, however, there's been a lot of improvement there with the uh, utilization of Zoom or healthcare focused platforms such as what uh, Heal has and, and others in the industry. But there's also a continuity of care uh, challenge uh, that uh, Justin talked about, where engaging uh, in virtual care, um, the patient may not be seeing their usual PCP. Um, and the physician on the other end uh, may know very little about that patient. And many of the telehealth focused providers have little experience with the risk adjustment programs. And so we view this as an opportunity to leverage our Perspective Insights API to deliver context about member conditions um, coupled with risk adjustment guidance to telehealth providers. And this is how it works. Uh, we rely on interoperability in a couple of important ways, one of which is we will uh, exchange data from disparate systems, um, sometimes coming from the health plan. Uh, it's not where you'd expect some of this data to come from, but there's a rich trove of data uh, that we will then feed into our machine learning to derive those insights. Um, and then we will send that information to uh, providers uh, by way of their EHR workflow tools to inform their decisions and their workflows. Um, and this is, again, the conditions about a member profile. You know, without interoperability, the data will remain siloed. Um, it would only benefit where the data is captured and constrained by their ability to mine that data for those insights. And with interoperability, um, we all benefit from uh, greater exchange of that data. And this is just one example of how interoperability is unlocking value, um, unlocking clinical value. Um, so I'm happy to describe more about what we're doing as we go on in this session, but this is, uh, this is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. All right, terrific. Thank you, Ellen. All right, great. So we, we, uh, now we've seen three, uh, three great panel pre uh, presentations on three very different types of uh, uh, products and services. Um, what I would invite now, first of all, is audience, please remember that please you can ask uh, questions to the Q&A button um, on, the, uh, on the bottom part of the, 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 the Zoom bar. Um, I'm going to invite the panelists to go on so we can ask, so we can, uh, we can answer some of those questions. I'll, I'll tee it up uh, and, um, and uh, we'll get started. Um, moderator, are we, oh, sorry, I'm the moderator. Um, host, are we planning to bring everybody on so we can, uh, can see everybody as they as respond to the questions? Uh, Aliyah, uh, uh, Eva, let's see if we can get everybody on. All right, I see Alan's here. Dr. Zaghi, Sam, perfect, great. All right, we have a crew, fantastic. All right, so I'll tell you what, you know, while we're, as we're waiting for more um, questions, I see we have some popping up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with um, having been around the interoperability block for the last decade, I have uh, no lack of analogies like uh, that I like to throw at us. I'm, I'm gonna choose one analogy today, which I hope will hopefully be a little bit informative to those of you who are either in the process of or thinking about building digital health ben ventures. And that's just a, the, the rose bush analogy. You know, interoperability comes with thorns uh, and roses. And I'll, I'm gonna start with, with, with the thorns. I'd like to ask you guys, all three of you, to share as you've gone through your course of building, of building these you know, excellent products and services, what are some of the challenges you have faced um, in terms of tackling interoperability? What did you know you were gonna have to work with? What did you not know? And, and particularly, given what you've learned as you've gone through the process of, of building interoperability to, en to enable your products and solutions, what's your advice to, uh, to those others who are going down that pathway as well? We can start in any order. Well, Sam, why don't we start with you for this question and then we'll you know, rotate starting person on, on each one. Sure. So two things come to mind um, in response to that question, Jin. The first one is, is patient demographics and kind of problems with patient demographics. So early in Verda's uh, kind of history, um, we made some mistakes around uh, collecting in, in the patient demographics we collected, where we weren't always getting and storing a legal name and verifying that name with an identity check. And you know we weren't always getting a totally accurate address, um, or sometimes we'd get a mailing address, but not a home address. And in working with health information exchanges, it becomes really, really hard if you, you know, if you don't know exactly your, the, your patient's legal name um, in your system, then it's really hard to, to interoperate with someone else's system. 
like the patient matching problem is real and it's difficult. Um, so I think kind of if I was to start over today, I think that uh, I would really lock down patient demographics um, and collect really high quality data uh, from the start. And then the other thing that, that comes to mind is kind of the relying, building applications on top of data that you, that you bring into your system um, comes with its own set of challenges. So specifically in, in the, um, one example, in the kind of use case that I shared around lab results, we, part of a, a lab result observation is a reference range. And in a fire resource that represents that observation, there's a property that is, that represents that reference range. You know, like what is too high, what is considered too low. And labs have different reference ranges or different observations. And the, the profile in fire isn't strict enough to really build an application on top of that data. Um, so, it, you know, we had to kind of ingest the data twice. So kind of bring it into our system and then normalize the data once it's within our system to really have our application rely on that. Um, I think that's kind of the, the two things that really come to mind. Hey, Sam, before I, before I ask uh, others to, our other panelists to weigh in, you know, there's been one, in, one question that's incrementally right on top of what you just shared. How, how did you end up, or how, how would you approach the demographics problem? Given the given the opportunity to start over, or or even sharing kind of what you what you've done so far. Yeah, so I think I would, and kind of where we're going is is I would use a similar process to what um, like a credit card company does, and and like use a third party provider who is an expert in um, identifying who someone is on the other side of a computer. I think it's especially hard in remote care. Um, like if you think back to when you show up at a, a doctor's office in person, um, you hand them your driver's license and maybe your insurance card. And those are the, the demographics that carry with you throughout your care journey. Um, but as a remote care clinic, like, you know, someone's filling out a form on our website. So I think that, you know, it's probably an easier problem uh, if you are practicing some in-person care. And at, so for us, I would, really leverage a third party who's an expert. Gotcha. All right. Okay. That's, that's very valuable. Dr. Zaghi, what about you? When you think about kind of the challenges you faced and you guys have overcome or looking to overcome, what would you share? So that's Yeah. I think about it a few ways, you know, first is, um, you know, getting access to enough data, you know, currently, as I mentioned, we're only getting data for about 70% of our patients. I would like to see, you know, the whole healthcare movement, capturing all of the data on a health information exchange so that providers can access all of the information. And it's all, you know, it's all within the idea of caring for the patient and delivering the, the like the right level of care. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, whenever I, I make this kind of a point, people are concerned about privacy. And I think that's something that requires its due attention. Also, there's the notion of consent about, you know, when I check these results in Health Gorilla, am I technically required to, um, to get consent? Does it need to be written consent? Can it be verbal consent? And I think it's an interesting question. Uh, but from a ethical perspective, I think that as a provider, if I am at least getting some kind of verbal consent or implied consent that the patient wants me to care for them and that they want me to get the information from other sources, um, that I should be able to access data from everywhere, not just the places the 70% of places where I've anecdotally been able to get data. Um, so I think that that's, that's one key piece of it. The other is make, how do we make the data more usable and useful really, right? Um, so I think, um, you know, in our current version of, of Health Gorilla, and this is the same across any platform, you know, when you make a request for the data, you get like, you get a, a data dump of CCDA and XML files. And some of those files aren't helpful at all. They're like continuity of care documents that have like filler data, like, you know, this patient had this visit a long time ago, or they have this allergy. And it's like the same information over and over and over again, right? Um, and as a busy physician who's like trying to manage a, like a, a panel of patients, you know, I want the information that's useful to me at the right time with the right level of detail. And 
you know, I, th I think this, this comes down to vendors like Health Gorilla and, I, and I'm, I'm impressed by um, Apixio and what you, what you guys are doing to, you know, bring the risk adjustment right to the point of care. But, but I do think that, that there is a need to uh, make the data more useful. I think, you know, also similarly, you know, patient ping with the notifications, I think that's like a very useful way of letting the provider know, hey, your patient's in the hospital your patient is um, being discharged. So, so I think that that's very important. And then how do you make this more efficient and, and quicker so that it's more seamless? Like currently it takes, it does take some time for us. I request the data, it may take up to a minute or so, uh, but how can we make that faster and, and easier? And I think that it, that in turn relates to the usability. 100%, you know, I'll tell you sharing from my experiences with uh, both the ONC and with Commonwealth uh, and my work with Carry Quality and the eHealth Exchange for that matter too. <clears throat> it feels like the period from 2010 to 2017 was like just assembling a large enough conga line of people to push on the tap of interoperability to get any data to flow. Right. And after seven years of assembling a huge line and getting everybody to push, we finally went from little trickle of data to like vast amount of data. And the tap opened up and what you got was not just a lot of data, but a lot of dirty data. And so it became incumbent now on the organizations who consume that data to start actually making sense of it, making useful, valuable insight out of the data. Very thankful that there's actually data. 70% is a huge number. You know, five years ago, you would have seen 2%, 3%, 5%, maybe. Now we're at 70%, and now but, but the deluge of data makes it all the more incumbent that you actually create something useful. Consent is also another tricky issue from state to state, it's just so different. Um, that uh, what happens is folks like Commonwealth, Carry Quality, these other organizations, they end up requiring the sender of the data in the first place to ensure that they're applying uh, local consent laws, which works for most of the US, but in some states, it ends up being tricky, especially where you have to have the patient who's getting care at that time provide their consent in real time at the other end. That, that's when it becomes particularly, particularly tricky. Um, Alan, I'm curious to hear, what are some of, you know, you guys have moved really far uh, to Dr. Zaghi's point. You guys are bringing, bringing this, this uh, information exchange right at the point of usage. What's, what's your experiences been like? Yeah, similar themes that everyone's talking about. Um, there's a technology kind of interfaces theme, a data completeness and quality theme, and a policy theme. So in terms of talking about the interfaces, uh, because there isn't a single place to go for all the data. Um, you're integrating with HL7, with Fire, with some standard APIs, custom APIs, and everyone, everything's a bit different. Um, and that's a, a significant lift. I think uh, companies, um, data integrators like Health Gorilla and others out there are making it a lot easier for folks to be able to do this. Uh, so you don't have to develop that full competency in-house or you can at least narrow that down. Um, so that's helpful. Uh, with the data, it's going to be inconsistent and messy. Um, and you need to embrace uh, the messiness. Um, so as you're thinking about the use case that you're trying to support, figuring out what are the essential data elements to support that use case. Understand that you're not always gonna get it, so design for that solution. And as you're managing data through your pipeline, understand where it's coming from. So when there's a question about the data, as you're surfacing and making data more visible to other people, uh, you need to be able to then figure out where it came from so you can figure out if there's something that needs to be corrected upstream from, from what you're doing. And then policy-wise with consent, um, uh, with the entities that are managing and responsible for data and passing it through, um, as a product, <laughs> in product development, we need to make sure that you get ahead of whatever the contracting and agreement requirements are, because sometimes that is lengthy. Um, so as you're thinking about, you know, where is the right source for the data that you're looking for and how are you going to engage that? What are the business drivers? Uh, what are the agreements that need to be put in place? Uh, ensuring that that's part of planning uh, for things that you're developing so that you can get ahead of that. Fantastic. Embrace the messiness. That, that, might, be, uh, that might be the theme. Actually, I need to adopt that theme for my office space. <laughs> <laughs> Embrace the messiness. I might actually try to clean it up. But, uh, you know, so we, we have actually received, apparently you guys are very inspiring because we now have this plethora of questions on the, on the Q&A and I'm pretty sure we won't be able to answer them all. But I'm seeing a couple of themes emerge. So let me ask you about the themes and hopefully that'll help answer a few questions at once. There's, there's certainly a theme here that, uh, that I'm seeing being asked around, um, uh, around 
choosing how to get tap into the, the world of the data. Like you've clearly a couple of you have made decisions around using Health Gorilla. I'm sure all of you examined a few different options in terms of how do you get the lab data? How do I get my EHR data? How do I get other types of data? I'll, can you maybe share a little bit about your thinking that went into choosing the pathway you did or, or and other pathways you're, you're you know, maybe even considering right now so that you can you know, lend some of the insights to uh, those who are still kind of have that, that journey ahead of them. Um, Dr. Zaghi, I picked on Sam first last time. Why don't I pick on you? Sure, first? sure. Happy, happy, to, happy to answer. So for us, it was really about having access to a breadth of data sources and also having it readily accessible and, and easy to use. So, you know, we'd spoken with various HIEs on a local level, uh, but we are a national company, right? We have doctors in California, Washington State, Georgia, New York, New Jersey, DC, Washington, you know, all, all of these various states, right? And so setting up with a local provider in California or, or New Jersey wouldn't, wouldn't work. So that, that limited our, you know, the, the pool to a certain degree, right? And then secondly, uh, you know, we had looked at some other uh, HIA partners and the usability was, was limited. They would give us like a data dump of the CCDAs and that requires on our end, the ability to take the CCDAs and analyze them. And there's some engineering costs associated with that, that we were, you know, we, we focus on house calls, we focus on telemedicine, we focus on remote monitoring, but we don't necessarily want to have to invest resources in every bit of our platform. So to the extent that we can leverage existing partners that like specialize in something like Health Gorilla specialize in this, you know, Health Gorilla was able to provide us with the user interface that not only collected the CCDA, but put it in a format that was usable where you could like go in and, you know, look for labs or look for vitals or look for vaccinations and was more user-friendly from a physician perspective. Fantastic. Alan, how would you think about it and respond? Yeah, for, for us, it's a matter of, um, uh, our customers are our health plans. And as we're thinking about that context and the source of data, they have data. And so we need to adapt to the format and um, how they're able to deliver that, that data. And I mentioned earlier in the presentation that much of that comes by way of scanned clinical documents, so PDFs. And so a lot of our focus was, well, this is what they have. How do you work with that? And so we've invested a lot in being able to manage that process of reading through these PDFs uh, to uh, identify the insights and normalize that and be able to use it for the various use cases that we have. In parallel, we realize how ridiculous the whole process is, that there's data in EHR and there's a print a PDF and it gets scanned and it goes over there and then passed over this way. Um, in parallel, working with integrators to figure out when we can, how do we get data directly from the source or at least minimize the steps it needs to go through for us to be able to take advantage of it. Um, and that is kind of the parallel streams that, that we're working towards to, uh, to address that. Gotcha. Sam, obviously same question back to you. Maybe you can, you know, since you also shared with us kind of the process through which you're receiving the data and maybe you can share a little bit about what's the lift like specifically through your health gorilla integration to give, give uh, the audience a little bit of a sense of how, how, what they should think about from an, an LOE perspective. Sure. I, uh, our decision-making process actually sounds a lot like HEALS, where we are a national clinic. Like We have patients in every state. We have providers that are credentialed in every state. And we, so like when we were evaluating options to acquire lab results, we considered point-to-point -point integration <laughs> with national lab networks like Quest and LabCorp. Um, but like it was really expensive in terms of engineering time. And I think a huge selling point for us was health girls, fire APIs. Like we use fire internally as an information model and we actually use it as our transactional data store is our fire server. So like the engineering cost was, was pretty light. It, it was weeks and really it was just me. Um, you know, we are a startup and engineering time is probably our most valuable resource and the thing we spend the most money on. Um, so like we, we couldn't afford to build our own point to point network, um, even leveraging a third party, something like, um, like a redox or someone that 
is an expert in building HL7 version two interfaces. So, you know, I think like, like Justin shared, we want to focus on the things that are unique to us as a clinic and our continuous remote care platform and the workflow that our providers, um, the kind of events that drive provider workflow are unique to us, but lab result acquisition is not. So leveraging Health Gorilla and like, you know, we became a Health Gorilla customer because of the national network of labs that we were able to, to take advantage of and to use and to send our patients to. Um, we've expanded our use with Patient360 and it's just become like, um, it's really like that is gravy for us and it's, it's let us pivot and continue to reverse diabetes in a world where we, we can't feel comfortable sending patients to a patient service center. Um, I guess lastly on the, the engineering cost, um, you know, health girls user interface is not something that our providers are in, but it really let us develop quickly because we had this user interface that was there that let us debug and see what, what actions our API calls were actually taking. Um, so, yeah, I, I, that, that's really it. All right. Well, you know, Sam, you, you mentioned several important points there. One point I'll, I'll uh, just resurface that particularly struck me is that uh, because I have this conversation with startups all the time who are looking to consider interoperability as an enabler of their full solution. And the question that always arises is, are, do you need to build a small handful of interface connections, which you could potentially do one by one and just suck up that one time cost and go forward? Um, or even hire somebody else to do it for you? Or, or, what do you, or do you really need a network? Do you really need to be able to get to the data in a variety of places today or in the future as you expand? And you know, the answer to those two, that question you know, really just changes what kind of organization we work with. Health Gorilla being one of the premier networks in that space, it becomes sensible um, for you know, the use cases where that makes a ton of sense. Now, look, we are, we're, we're actually approaching time and we're still getting a pile on of questions. Um, why don't we do this uh, so that we don't run out of time altogether uh, why don't we move towards closing remarks? And what I'm going to ask uh, of each of the three panelists, and Alan, this time, I'll, you know, a third question, so I'll pick on you first to start. Um, in your closing remarks, why, I would love for you to share, um, I, I, would love for you, I would love you to share two perspectives as you can. Um, has COVID in particular, that's obviously the, sort of the, the, the big white elephant in sort of any room, uh, how, how has that impacted your business or not? And you know, with or without COVID, Kind of what do you see as the future of sort of interoperability from your, the perspective of your business? And please, if you can, punctuate your remarks with uh, your, some information so that users can contact you, your, your website or a contact address for, for your company so that anybody here who would love to follow up offline has that opportunity. So, can you take that away? That's great. I'll, st I'll start with that so I don't forget. Um, you can uh, visit and learn more about Apixio at www.apixio.com. Um, but in terms of the, uh, the, two, uh, the two themes, so one in terms of um, how has you know, COVID affected the business? Um, well, in, in, uh, in a couple ways, um, you know, I mentioned the process by which uh, health plans are able to retrieve clinical documents from, from providers is uh, manual through some chart retrieval and, and moving that forward. Um, providers have been focused on caring for those directly impacted by COVID. Um, uh, so some of these other programs are a lower priority in, in, the, in the heat of it as, it, as it should be. And so there is a challenge in being able to get access to data through those avenues. Um, for us, because of our technology, we're able to service our customers in a more efficient way than some of the other um, of our competitors. And so it actually helps us in that we're going to be compressed for time and we're well situated to be able to support our customers within that compressed time. So it's a benefit to a certain extent. Uh, but the other aspect is, um, and this kind of ties into the future, is that whole process should go away. It's nonsensical. Um, uh, and, you know, interoperability is the platform by which we can enable more efficient access to the, da the data that's required to support all kinds of programs um, around healthcare, from direct patient care to the reimbursement and how incentives are managed and measuring the quality of care around so that everyone can benefit from it. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Sam, why don't you go for it? I'm sorry. And I, and I, I've kind of, I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you guys to compress the answer just as Alan did there so that we can, we can try to knock it out before, uh, before we run out of time here. Go for it. Sure. So like Alan, I'll start with contact information. 
Learn more about Verda at vertahealth.com. And I am Sam at vertahealth.com. So pretty easy. Um, don't, don't email Sami, S-A-M-I at vertahealth.com. That is our CEO. Uh, <laughs> um, so how has COVID affected our business? I think like Alan, our, our customers who are mostly self-insured employers are distracted. And like their core concern right now is responding to COVID. Um, at least it was for kind of the last three months. Now, as we, we're kind of coming out of it, our, a lot of our customers are realizing that you know, patients with chronic conditions like type 2 diabetes are, have a higher risk of being affected by COVID. So I think we're starting to see kind of uh, more interest from our customers. Um, I think I already shared quite a bit about our response to COVID and how it's, how it's changed our processes. Um, and then on the kind of future of interoperability, uh, you know, I guess this isn't really as Verda, but as Sam, you know, I think I believe that we are moving towards consumer directed exchange. And with ONC's final rule that came out a few months ago, um, patients are going to have access to their data in FHIR format. And with that, I think we will see an explosion of applications built on top of data that patients are providing. And as a patient, I'll be able to share um, individual components of my data with the care providers I want. Um, so I think that that's where we're going. Um, it's good. It might take a little while to get there. Um, but we are going there. Absolutely. 100% agreed, Sam. Thank you. Doc, Dr. Zaghi, can we do a little well, well, punctuated with you? Sure. So heal.com and you can email me at justin.zaghi at heal.com, Z-A-G-H-I. Um, as far as how COVID has changed our business, it's really accelerated our telemedicine rollout. So prior to COVID, telemedicine was in our world was always doctor initiated, meaning I'd see the patient and book a follow-up visit, say to monitor how they're doing on their diabetes medication or how they're doing with their depression or so on. Um, and with COVID, we saw a strong need to let patients initiate the telemedicine um, so that we could provide care virtually. And so our engineers have done a really world-class phenomenal job of building a platform in, in record-breaking time that has, has um, been, been quite transformative and helpful for our practice. Um, as far as the future of interoperability, um, you know, I come from it, I, I treat a lot of older patients as well. And so that leaves me to have a little bit of skepticism about the consumer holding onto their health data and, you know, having it on their phone, their iPhone. Many of the patients I treat may not have a smartphone. And so that actually to me is the benefit of these health information exchanges, because when I saw that 80 year old female, she certainly did not have a smartphone, but I was still able to access the data from the health systems. So from a practical pragmatic perspective, I still like the current approach of, a of accessing it on a health information exchange. Awesome. It makes perfect sense. Okay, I want to thank all three of you. Thank you so much for excellent presentations. Very interesting, very, very unique points of view. Uh, a nice diverse kind of set of perspectives on uh, on digital health. Um, Ali, I'd like to pass it back to the Health Girl and Plug and Play teams. Thank you to uh, to wrap us up. Wonderful. Thank you, Jitlin, and everyone, um, to all of our speakers, to our panelists for sharing your rich insights and your use cases with us. Um, a few of you in the audience have asked, um, yes, we have recorded the session and we'll share the video with you all very soon. So stay tuned for that. Um, if you have any questions or if you'd like to learn more about the Plug and Play Health Program, about Health Gorilla, please feel free to reach out to me directly and I'd be happy to help connect you to anyone. Um, and last but not least, we have a quick survey that's popped up on your window. So we'd appreciate if you fill it out before signing off. Um, so thank you again to everyone for participating and for joining us today. I hope you all are staying safe um, and have a great rest of your week. Thank you.